Welcome to the Mental Advantage Podcast. Whether you're an athlete trying to perform at your best when it counts the most, a coach or business leader trying to get more out of your team, or someone looking for more personal growth, this is the place for you. This podcast is your map to guide you to the right mindset, systems, and strategies you need to become the best version of yourself. And now, here's John Cullen and Brandon Allen. Brandon, we've got a a great guest on the show. We teased this last week, Brett McCabe, um, really going to be a fantastic interview. Brett's got that unique experience in that he's probably arguably uh, worked with two of, in their respective sports, the uh, greatest coaches that that have done it. Right? I mean, and, oh, and yeah. uh, I mean, Skip two Bertman, Titans, right? Titans. Bertman and yeah, Bertman and, and Saban. Saban. Not too bad. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, think when you ask people to list the coaches, those two names are going to come up. Pretty they're quick. probably going to be in the top five of everybody's yeah. list that that knows about that. Right? I mean, you got the Augie Garritos and. I mean, there, there's you right. got some others, and, right, and right. Some of those you got guys. those guys, yeah. but I mean, I, I'm I'm really interested and in, in excited to hear about um, kind of what he learned from Skip and how that works today, and what similarities he sees between those two. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. we'll, we'll talk to him about that and just kind of the cultures that they have built in both of those programs, sure. the one he experienced as a player and the one he's now working with on a daily basis and, and what makes those programs unique. Uh, and then he's also uh, hopefully we'll talk to him a little bit about um, overcoming some of those pain points that all of us are dealing with, dealing with pressure, self-doubt, some of those things. So we'll get into all of that stuff. But I'm really excited for you all, the listeners, definitely a pad and pen uh, kind of a uh, you know notebook and pen kind of a show today is make sure you take lots of notes because Brett is going to unpack a lot of things and, and probably uh, sell a little Chick-fil-A in the process. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, we want to welcome to the show, Brandon, Brett McCabe. Um, Brett, you all heard me talk about on last week's show as we were kind of teasing this episode is going to be coming at this from a lot of different angles today. Uh, First of all, he's a licensed clinical psychologist. He earned degrees from LSU and um, also did some post-grad stuff at Brown. Um, not a bad place to go and get some additional education, right? Brown University, uh, four year letterman on the, the baseball team and a member of two national championship teams and some sec championships and three college world series teams. He's also a practicing sports and performance psychologist who works with numerous athletes, the PGA, LPGA tour folks in NFL, NBA, you name it. And one of the things that he's doing is he's also the sports and performance psychologist for the University of Alabama um, and published many articles. I mean, the intro itself, if I went forward with everything would be about an hour like he's done a lot of stuff let's just say brett's accomplished a lot since accomplished, we're, we're relatively yes. all in the same we went to college all at the same time brandon but i think brett was on a little bit he took a little bit different trajectory little, than little, we did a little different a little different yeah. path for sure yeah a little, little bit more overachieving than we were but here's some of the things that we're going to talk about today and the reason i want to bring it up is so brett's the author of two books he's actually author of more books than this but the two books that we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about today is the mind side manifesto, the urgency to create a competitive mindset. And I was telling Brett before we started recording here, it probably is going to become my go-to graduation gift for <clears throat> folks, because I think that the things that he unpacks in there, and we'll dive into some of it in this book, will set people up for, forget athletics, just life in general, um, how to deal with you know pressure situations and having a game plan uh, for life. And then ironically, that's also another book that he's done is a workbook called The Game Plan, Managing Your mm-hmm. Champ and Chump. Done some other things, founder of the Mind Side, uh, which is a performance consulting group, and then Secrets of Winning podcast and uh, the Catalyst School. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I won't go through all of them. We'll we'll talk about them when we get to the uh, in- show introduction, uh, because there's lots of stuff on brettmccabe.com that you're going to want to uh, to to look for and then mm-hmm. his social media content. But Brett, thanks for joining us. We're really really excited to have you on the show. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and it's always fun to talk to some baseball guys and, um, you know, get back in the dugout a little bit. Absolutely. So speaking of baseball guys, you were at, were you at LSU then with the Warren Morris walk-off? Was that uh, so, one of the teams you were out there with? No. So that was the first year I was done. My fifth year was the year before. Wow. And okay. It's an interesting story about Warren. So my roommate in college was a guy by the name of Todd Walker who played yeah. a long time in the major leagues. Sure. And, and Warren came in and, and what coach Burtman did was um, coach had figured out a, a way to kind of use his red shirt year as a farm system. And it probably led to a little bit of some of the roster management you see in the NCAA today, but it was actually a brilliant strategy because he knew what he wanted. And my high school was an all boys Catholic school in Baton Rouge. And I was one of the first ones. There were a couple of guys ahead of me, but I was one of the first ones that came in. And then he had this process of finding local guys that were academic students who were probably a year behind in the developmental cycle. Mm -hmm. He'd bring them in. And we'd redshirt. We'd be preferred walk-ons because we were there on academic ride. And then, you know, you'd be a part of the team. You'd do everything. you just redshirt. Well, Warren did that. I did that. Kurt Ainsworth, who founded Marucci Back Company, did that right. and was a first pick in the major league draft. Or not first pick in the draft, but first round draft pick. Right. And a couple others like that. Um, Jason Williams, who also – and the, the list is long. And it, what he would do is he would put us there and then work us out, train us, learn the game. And when Todd was there, Todd was a superstar and Warren came in um, as that smart kid, really fast, no strength, and just literally got to work in the weight room and followed everything that Todd did. And so Todd's junior year, Warren had to get on the field because in his redshirt year, he, you know, figured it out. And we put him in left field. He would play, he would DH some. And then when Todd left, he moved to second base. And Warren was just a natural leader. Warren was a kid who um, did everything right and followed the game the right way. And that was really important for us at LSU. I mean, Skip used to say, you'll have a PhD in baseball by the time you leave here. Yes. Um, you had to understand the game at a higher level than just, hey, coach is telling me to bunt. Um, and so we, so Warren was just in a perfect spot. The cool thing about that team was that team was most of my teammates because our, my, our 95 season, it was the first year Todd and another first rounder had left. We had we were midway through the year and had the we were the number one team in the country and had the best pitching staff in the country. And we we I, I'm not gonna blame it on this, but we went to Ole Miss and and all probably got the norovirus. Oh, wow. We thought it was food poisoning from an outback steakhouse or something, but <laughs> about been there <laughs> thirty six hours later, man. If you remember the scene, stand by me. That's what it was like. <laughs> yeah, really? And, yeah, it was awful. And so bad that on the Saturday game, I didn't even go to the game. About Warren didn't go to the game. Our starting center fielder didn't go. Me and Warren are sitting in our hotel rooms, and we all kind of sat in one room. I mean, the maids wouldn't clean our rooms. It was that Holy bad. Wow. I mean, it was coming out of both ends. And yeah. We had a pitcher playing second base who played second base in high school, and the one kid who doesn't get sick has a no hitter for eight and two thirds innings and gives up a home run. But um, it was so funny, it, but we just never recovered as a team after that. We, we yeah. got beat two out of three that weekend. We lost the Friday night game, not because of that. We lost Friday night game because we got beat. And, um, but you know, we, we, we just never really found our rhythm again and lost five of our last six weekends. And then, and what happened was we got in the postseason. We ran into a team from Rice. Cal State Fullerton got sent to our regional yeah. with Mark Kotze and yeah, uh, oh yeah, Starloose and a bunch of really good. We knew like, oh man, these guys are good. Right. Well, Rice beat us twice, and we didn't know anything about who Rice was. Um, well, Rice had Lance Berkman as their first baseman. Yeah. Matt Anderson, who was the number one pick in the draft, two years later as their closer. Um, Jose Cruz Jr., who was a first rounder, and then this kid Mark Quinn, who was AL Rookie of the Year one year with the Kansas City Royals. They just crushed us two times, yeah. and so that team got beat. We they lost. We lost probably four seniors like me and a couple other guys. Our all time winningest pitcher left, and then he made some changes, and that team came back seasoned, ready, and hungry. And hit absolute bombs, and that's kind of the formation of what they call gorilla ball. Now, I was just yeah. getting ready to say that yeah. that was the time when Rosenblatt Skip was really good at taking advantage of everything Rosenblatt was going to. He yeah. was one of the first that really said, 
I'm just going to start recruiting to that stadium, right? I mean, yeah. that, you know, because that well, was... he, you know, when people forget, they they were they think of Skip as a if you if you're a college baseball fan, you think of Skip as having the gorilla ball teams, but the truth was Skip was a pitching coach, mm-hmm. and he was probably the finest pitching coach that, that ever coached the game. He understood the game from a very high level of our pitchers, and we we're very simple in the way we did things. But he, um, you know, when we won it in '91, it was pitching. We we hit bombs, but it was once again, older guys. It was, mm-hmm. you know, things like that, but we pitched. Um, I think my, the pitching staff, my freshman year had six major leaguers on it. Wow. So, you know, you, you're just around that and, and you pitched it very intellectually. You, you knew how to prepare, you knew how to execute, you knew how to do those things. And then we won it in 93. We were just a balanced team. We actually set the school record for errors. I mean, it was, you, you, we were never the most talented. We were never, we just played the game the right way. We right. understood skip, is taught something called how to win awareness, which was, you know, the ability to shift without having to be told to shift. It was the ability to see a down angle and take second base. It was, you know, and and he would wait for players to demonstrate that they had HWA to be able to play and work themselves out of jams. So when Gorilla Ball came about, it came about because the bats were getting hot. Yeah. At the end of 96. I remember yep. them. I remember Easton coming to us in 94 with our our first rounders that we had and they they said look we got some bats that'll come out next year we want you to we're going to chart every bat every ball you hit in in batting practice because we want to see if it'll dent and we didn't actually put them in play we put them in play a little bit in 95 i think we probably were on the early cusp of getting them and then 97 is when the bats were just great 97 98 they were just yeah. wild but 96 team hit a lot of home runs because they were really, really freaking good. I mean, yeah. that's what it was. It wasn't yeah. that right. they were juiced up or anything. Yeah. Um, but Warren's story is is remarkable. I mean, he he is a kid who who did everything right. And he just understood the game. He knew how to play the game. And it was coach was coaching the Olympic team in 96. And Warren and and Jason Williams two kids off our team, the shortstop and, and second baseman were the starting shortstop and second baseman in the Olympics. Both of them were walk-ons. Yep. Both of them were local. Both of them were superstars at LSU. And that's what made that program so good. And so Warren, yeah, long answer to that. Warren was awesome. Well, um, played the game the right way. No. Didn't, um, it, and it, you just made me think of something that I had a theory of baseball class in, in college, not to be too stereotypical of college athletes, but, uh, it, it God, but, I never took anything like that. That was awesome. There, well, it no, was you really, were getting really it cool. from Skip. So yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you were, you, that was your theory of baseball <laughs> yeah. class. But, um, but I remember learning about tigerisms and how Skip had those, you know, tigerisms were those things that, it, um, and maybe this came later or, or before, but it was, we, it was just basically the basics, right? It was the, yeah. you know, uh, what to do on a line drive as a runner, like all of the things that, you know, he just wanted these things to become second nature. So, they did. And, and I'm looking up here, um, Brian Kane went down, yep. and met with Skip a couple of years ago and took our folders and published them. And, and so what would, what would happen is I don't see it in here. I've got it somewhere in one of my drawers, but, um, you know, Skip would have every Friday night we would go to meetings during the fall and, and we'd go to the dorm when none of us lived in the dorm. I don't know why we went to the dorm, but we went to the dorm and we'd separate into athletes, non-athletes. So pitchers and catchers as the athletes in one room, the non-athletes in the other room. And we would go through scenarios and, you know, you would go through this list and it was the same list and you do it for five years straight. I mean, it was, it was, and his answer was, look, you're going to hear it different. So I'm going to, I'm going to be consistent. Like I'm not changing the way I do things. And, you know, it was like, you know, 82% of the time a pitcher throws to first base and a pickoff, the next pitch is a ball. Yeah. So what does that mean? You need to raise your level of focus and intention to it. So 74% of all batted balls are outs. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, that means that, um, why are you afraid to pitch to contact? Because that also includes foul balls that are not outs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you're going to throw a 2-2 pitch, you better be willing to throw it on 3-2. So you get to a point pitching for him, you're one step ahead of him. He's three steps. He's three innings ahead. Yeah. But he's calling pitches, and you're one step ahead. And you didn't even, you know, he gave us the right to shake off every pitch he called. I can only think one time in my career I did it because yeah, like, you were right there with him. Right. Like, and And that's what he wanted to see. He didn't care if you threw 98 miles an hour, if you couldn't throw it the right way and you couldn't field a bunt and you couldn't do a pickoff. He didn't want you on the field. Yeah. And we didn't have, I mean, my God, we didn't have fancy 
bunt defenses and pick off plays or anything like that. Right. Um, but he, he, he really focused on the things that mattered, right? The, Mm -hmm. the things that get you to a position of being successful and, you know, those tigerisms or those, um, it was to him, it was an extra bullet in the chamber. It was an extra arrow in your quiver. Yeah. And, and he would look across the field and he would know like, look guys, they, they're good. Like they're really talented, but they're not baseball guys. They're just right. athletes. We're more prepared than they are. Well, those 100%. yellow pages, what is it? The yellow pages, the yellow book. you talk, yep. the yellow yeah. book that you mm-hmm. talk about in the, in the book. One of those things, ironically, was one of the things that you learned in those meetings with the 80% of all leadoff walks in the, you know, scoring. Yeah. And that worked on you for a while because Long you time. say in the book how you weren't, I mean, from a mental game standpoint, you felt like you're pretty terrible about that, you know, in college yeah. as far as in having to adjust. But there was something that a conversation that you had with Skip where that, you know, and I love for you coaches out there. I love one of the things that Brett talks about in the book is how when Skip would be wanting to talk to you and address you, uh, he would, you know, either put like both hands on your shoulders or something that was going to let you know this was personal, right? This was that, that I need it. I need your attention kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, he, um, he, he knew, he knew what it, he knew us better than we knew ourselves. And, you know, you, you, you see him and you're like, Oh man, coach is coming over here. But he was also, he just, our guys would walk through. I mean, we, we walk through walls for that man. I mean, yeah. still to this day, he's 82. And if something happened to him, he'd have 150 guys down at his, at his yeah. second call right now. But you know, yeah, I was one of those guys mentally that did everything right, but just never did the I never did anything great. Um, mm-hmm. I did. I did everything that was asked me. I went in the gym. Mm-hmm. I worked out. I did my work. I prepared, but I just never got the quote results right. And that was hard because I would see guys that didn't do everything right, and they would get the results. And maybe they were more talented than me, and that that was true. But it, it took it took me it took me four years. Well, it, my third year, I was ready to go, and then I got injured and. But there, you got to have a little bit extra, right? You got to have like a fifteen percent buffer. That buffer is like that specialness, man. It's that in Louisiana we call it land yap or gree gree is like a little bit of voodoo magic. <laughs> but it's the it's that next little extra of of having that panache that's different. Like you do everything right, super, but can do you have that little bit of fire inside, that little bit of blood in your mouth to take that next step? And I think I'd done so many things well, and I was just playing from a world of I'm doing everything right. The results should be there. Mm-hmm. The results just don't show up. Right. You, you've got to have something that makes the results show up, or you got to have that little bit of extra fire and fight. You got to do something. And, and I didn't understand that because I, I was doing everything right. And everyone said, if you just do this, this, you'll be successful. And that's not true. Like there, there's got the best players and I'm, a, I get to see them now and the best players they just do something special that they may not even realize what they're doing, but there's something that they did a little bit extra. And for me, I had to find, I had to stop pitching away from what I feared. I had to start locking into what I wanted and just deal with it if it doesn't go well. And it's amazing is, is when I finally broke through and, and it was after a shoulder injury and i lost my throwing mechanics here I am throwing mid eighties or the low mid eighties in the SEC. It's shocking. Um, I had a an amazing slider that I could throw almost as hard as my fastball, and I could strike people out like it was nothing. Really? I mean, it was it was comical, and people would look and and it's like this guy, and you look at my stat line, and I would dominate people, and it was so funny. And and I say I dominated them because I could think them. I could. Yeah. I, there was something else. And I used, <clears throat> I used the idea that it's going to suck for you when I strike you out. You know, if, if, if I'm facing, you know, a first rounder like Mark Bellhorn at Auburn who played in the major leagues and I struck him out, I was like, God, that sucks for you. <laughs> like, but that was the way that I was able to see it as an advantage. And, yeah. you know, Mark Bellhorn probably, probably looked at me and was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I mean, last night, Freddie Freeman struck out on a pitch from Anthony right, Rizzo. Rizzo. I mean, yeah. you know, that was me. I was Anthony Rizzo type of yeah. guy, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was like, right. what the hell is this guy doing striking me <laughs> yeah. out? But it worked for me, and I found that. And and so that's kind of what led to the book of the Mindside Manifesto was like, look, you got to do something else. Mm. Like, 
you, you hire somebody for a job. They do. They check all the boxes. That's not why we hired you though. Mm-hmm. They, we, we, we hire a coach to do the job. And, you know, I work long hours, but they sit at their desk and they just check the boxes. Mm-hmm. You've got to have this something extra, this, this, this deep call within that is like, look, I refuse to accept where I'm at is where I want to be. And I want to fight like hell to get it. I mean, when it hurts, what are you pulling on? Mm-hmm. What are you, what are you diving into when you, you know, have to go to the gym and you don't want to go to the gym when you have to make that extra sales call, you have to make that extra, you know, you got to put in that report and you just want to make it just a little bit better. Are you just turning in the report just to get it done? That was me. I was just doing it. It's like, okay, that that's good enough, but that's not what was good enough. That's, yeah, that's cool. So, so, so how, how, the, how do you translate that today? So you, you are, working with some of the best athletes and, and a lot of times those athletes um, have had success without having to really focus on that mental game. Right. Um, Do you find it a challenge to, to have those Uber athletes buy into because, because typically what they were giving was always good enough. Like you said, putting in that rep just to put in the rep was always good enough. Um, do you yeah. find that to be a challenge today? Well, the good news is very few people come to me unless they're having an issue, right? Okay. So they've kind of learned that lesson before they've gotten to me. That's good. Um, that helps. But thankfully, we're 20 years advanced than from where I competed and probably where y'all competed, where if you went to the sports psychologist, it was like, because you were having major, major issues, right? right. Yeah. Now it's hey, I want an advantage. Mm-hmm. Like I saw the I saw you work with somebody else. I want that, and mm-hmm. I could get a little bit better here. And so the way I describe it is to them is that <clears throat> success is a formula, in my opinion. You have your talent and skills, and yes, <clears throat> talent and skills matter, no doubt about it. But it's really not the separator mm-hmm. that it is at lower levels. Right. Okay, when you're a major league pitcher. And you throw 100 miles an hour in high school, 98. You're going to blow away the kid who's going to be an accountant in college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, it's the same thing I tell my D, my wide receivers or DBs at Alabama. It's like, look, you are now going against five stars. You're not going against kids that are leaving their fraternity. Right. I don't mean right. that in a bad way. <laughs> yes. Good guys. Yeah. You know, they're going to tell all their buddies and in, in, um, out at, uh, at flag football that, that they used right. to guard, you know, yeah. uh, John Mechie or, or yeah. Devontae Smith. Right. So – um, you know, you, you, you look at that and say talent and skills. Okay. Well, every day we need to be developing those skills. We need to get better at them and understand what they are, but it's how we apply those skills under increasing levels of pressure. Mm-hmm. And that's moving up the mountain, right? That's, that's like playing call of duty and playing campaign where you have to advance through levels. You have to advance through the levels in every level. You have to break a threshold and then you move to the next level. And usually those thresholds are gaining wisdom about a certain skill set or ability that you have. So, I don't care how good you are in practice. I don't care how good you are when mom and dad think how good you are. What I care about is when it, when it's on the line, how good are you? Because the third piece of this success formula is, is that you have to be mentally flexible. Mental flexibility is a high level skill. Um, and it, it, it's, I, I was talking about it for a long time. And then I came across somebody I really look up to in the field of psychology by the name of Stephen Hayes, who, um, is the founder of a concept called ACT, which is acceptance yep. and commitment therapy, which has just really guided a lot of my professional and personal growth in the last two years, three years. And he calls it psychological flexibility. And I did a podcast with Steven and I'm like, hey, we're on the same page because we had a lot of similarities. <laughs> um, but so I call it mental flexibility just because it's easier. But mentally flex- flexibility is to take what's in front of you and adapt, mm. right? It's it's whether we want to call it our response, you know, the Brian Kite, E yep. plus R equals yep. O, who I love, Brian. Whatever it is, the stoicism is it's whatever happens to me, I can adjust. It's that ability to say, okay, here's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do? Right. Hey, I just got screwed on a call by an umpire. I am pissed to the nines. Okay. Don't get, don't, don't suppress the emotion. Let's adapt. Yeah. What's our next step? What's our next purpose? Yeah. Coach Saban just chewed you up and down. You look him in the eye, you accept it, move on. You don't walk in wallow in, in your misery. It's the ability to adapt. And that psychological flexibility is what I find with the elite athletes. 
The last factor is, is circumstance or luck that we just can't focus on. And people will say, wow, the best players or LSU baseball was lucky right. or, you know, Alabama football. So lucky. It's like, mm, so we can't really focus on that. All we can do is show up and be ready to go. But the reason why we think great teams are lucky is because we see the first and fourth factor, great talent. You say, well, they're Alabama football tonight as we're recording. This is going to have five first rounders. Right. Okay. Yes. But let's go through those five first round. Mac Jones, third guy in a quarterback room. Okay. Um, busted his ass, did everything right. Focused on his process and way to get in a position. Worked with Mac for a long time. He's a stud. Um, he, he graduated. He's got high HWA. He understands his process and his way that he does things. You got Devonte Smith, who was the third man in a wide receiver room. Mm-hmm. You know, if we remember correctly, last year Alabama football had two first round wide receivers. Yeah. They're going to have two more first round wide receivers tonight, right? right. Jalen Waddle, who who managed and and went through a, a catastrophic injury this year, and chose to come back and play in the national title game. Okay, that was his choice. That was not anybody else's statement. That was what he wanted to do. What does that tell you about a kid? Right. right. He, he's, he's risking draft stock and all this other stuff, but he wants to do it because of that. You, you've you got um, a kid by the name of Alex Leatherwood or Najee Harris or Landon Dickerson, all seniors. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So of those guys that I mentioned, only one is an underclassman. But these are kids who who found a way to manage those middle two, how to play under pressure, playing for the hardest coach in America. But he's so much like Coach Burtman, it's scary. I was going to ask you that. It's yeah. unbelievable. Those two were, and, and Coach Burtman was his AD. And I'm not going to say that he, you know, Coach told me that that Skip's the, or uh, Nick's the greatest coach to ever call, coach a team sport in the country ever. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And he's like, he's the top I mean, of the list. That is. High when you think praise. about who's, yeah, that's huge praise. And he said, I've watched it firsthand. And so when you look at what they developed, was this ability to adapt and adjust to a demanding coach, a demanding scheme, five stars all around you. But when Mac met with me his freshman year, he was going through a little something and, and he meets with me and he tells me, he says, I said, why did you come here? And you got Jalen Hurts leading. You got Tua, who everybody wants to be the quarterback. I'm sure they're going to you know, recruit the next best thing after you. And he said, I came here because it's what was going to make me the best, but I can guarantee by the time I leave here, Doc, they'll know my name better than anyone else's. Wow. wow. And, and so what does that take? But what he did was when he assumed the starting role when Tua went down with his injury last year and he was meeting with Sark and Coach Sarkeesian, I was like, listen, you're going to get a notebook and you're going to spend time. And I knew he's an intellectual kid. I knew he's got a lot of energy in his head. And so I'm like, we're going to take notes, everything that you do. You're going to walk around every meeting with Sark, every meeting with Nick, every meeting with you know everybody you meet with, you're going to take notes. And he texted me the night before the Notre Dame game. And he said, man, I am ready to go. He said, I took 70 pages of notes on their defense. I filled up a notebook. So when he sees a guy shift, it's not the first time he's seen it, right? He, he, you know, most kids will say, yeah, I'll journal. A week later, they're done with it. But Mac did it for an entire year. He walked around with a notebook and just constantly took notes. And if he was meeting with our new strength and conditioning coaches, he was taking notes. And he just, he absorbed it. And he won those middle two factors. Yeah. The ability to apply under pressure. People, people, you know, I love this in the draft. It's like, oh, you can't do this. Listen, that kid threw the ball exactly in the window that needs to be thrown every single right. time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's amazing. The harder you work, the luckier you become. It's amazing. Right? Yeah. It's amazing. It's, well, and, and, you, and that's the thing is, right? Look, I mean, he's not going to win any talent contest. Right. He is talented. He can throw it. Yeah. He's tall. He sees things. Um, but it, it's, it's not the fact, you know, for st- to your question, Brandon, in the very beginning is that, you know, we rely so much as parents and as coaches on seeing our kids have all the tools and all the skills. And like, I'm going to take them to five different, you know, private coaches because they yeah. shouldn't strike out. They shouldn't miss that kick. Yes. They yeah. shouldn't all this. Um, yeah, they should. And they yeah. will. If they're getting, if they're getting better, the game is going to get chaotic. And I, and I get people, even with my tour players. You know, they'll call and they'll say, I can't believe he blew that lead. I can't believe he made that swing. I'm like, you know, my other players who are, and I'll say something to them. They're like, oh, yeah, seriously? Like, yeah. we can prevent something bad? I mean, it's really hard out there. Mm-hmm. And so what I want them to be is to be flexible in the moment, focused in the moment, intentional in the moment, but accepting of the outcome. Right. Knowing that it's hard. Knowing that it's difficult, but I can handle it. And mm-hmm. and 
so talent will get us so far. Talent will overcome a lot of mental deficiencies until it won't. Yeah. Until it can't. And that's where that's where we're I think I'm 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 tickled pink to see what what's happening in the sports world where the mental side we're just at the tip of the the iceberg of this because you're gonna see neurologically based um products, you're gonna see you know, people jumped a lot on the EEG or the EMG stuff. Yeah. It's fine. Um, it's okay. If it helps you relax, that's great. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot more coming in the next couple of years. And you're going to see, I mean, we are, we've already seen it in college where the departments used to be one full-time person. Now we've got 12, you know, now at Alabama, we're all part-time because that's how we want it. Right. We want to be able to have exposure to athletes across many spectrums and bring it back into the athletic department. But um, you're seeing, you're seeing anything I can do to get that extra bullet in my quiver yeah. or my ex, you know, extra arrow in my quiver to use coach's statement. Well, and, and, and you talk about in the book, Brett, the pressure moment and employing that switch. And one of the things I like a lot about that is you just hit on it was, you know, handling that pressure, being able to handle the pressure, but you come at it from this idea that, you know, in practice, it's all about that building and growth and in, in the games, it's about the outcomes. Like so many people are afraid, I think in, in mental performance or mental skills, whatever they, they, you know, really shy away from this idea of being outcomes focused. It's okay as a player to understand outcomes are there. That's what you're shooting for in game well, situations, yeah. but it's, it's understanding that it's uncertain, right? Like you can't, the only thing you can in that moment control is what you can control. And I love you share how, you know, one of the things you talk a lot about uh, with players is like, an or you have a friend that's a trauma orthopedic surgeon mm-hmm. and how when he comes in, outcomes are really important for him, right? But mm-hmm. he's focused on those things he can control in the, you know, the constants. So I'm, I'm working on a new book. In fact, it's, it should be done here. It, it's in a final edits final improvements, but it's called, um, break free from suckville. And it's this <laughs> idea that, that we suck all the time because we're failing to reach our potential. And that space between our potential and our reality is what players often describe as suckville because they feel so frustrated all the time. And what happens is we ignore our reality and cause we constantly anchor to this. We hang our, our dreams on our potential. And so every time our, um, we hit, close to our potential, we just raise our expectations. Okay. So we never reach them. Mm-hmm. And, and so what you have to understand is the outcomes are important. And, and I'll hear people say, trust the process. And look, I you know played for a coach that was trust the system. And uh, it, I've got a coach that's trust, you know, that Alabama's trust the process, but it's really about what's the wisdom you're gaining while you do that. And then what are the things that you're doing to explore and experience the successes of what you're doing? And, you know, it, it's, do you, are who's the dog in the fight to get it done? And that switch to know that if you're out there looking for validation or proof of the greatest uncertainty that we have is in competition in sports, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's so uncertain. It's so unknown. It's so difficult. You can't, the more you try to control it, the more it, it bucks you. It's like riding a bull. You have to ride the bull. You can't control the bull. And the the game is like that because what happens is in the game is, is when we are trying to control, we're usually trying to protect, you know, if we're truly confident, I'm not trying to control anything. I'm just gonna go make it happen. Like, okay, that's fine. I got it. Um, but when we're fearful of the future, then I got to control it. Like if I'm afraid to fall off the bike, I'm going to over control the bike. If I'm not afraid of fly, uh, falling off the bike, I don't have a problem with it. You know, people, I love to go snow skiing and people who go snow skiing, if they're afraid to fall, they will overcorrect and fall constantly. If you just realize that falling is part of the, you know, the growth of learning how to ski, you, you become a good faller. You know, you look, you get, you know how to get back up. Right. And what happens is you don't fall as much. Right. And that's what it is. That has to be that way in, in performance too, is that, you know, as a player, you know, in everything that you're doing, you have to be willing to understand that the game is an absolute uncertainty. You don't know how any of it's going to go. It doesn't matter right. how prepared you are. You cannot control the outcome. Definitely. So if you use the outcome, if you use the competition to validate that your, your preparation, if you use it to prove something, you're going to get bucked, man. It's going to own you. And it's going to make sure it's going to beat you with everything it's got. Well, I love the way I think, I think you had said about, 
if if you're using yesterday's out results or outcome as your preparation for today, you will constantly you'll constantly be failing. Hundred percent. Right? I mean, because it, you're it's the it's the wrong it's the wrong measuring stick for sure. Well, because what happens is you know we look at our performance and we're like, well, if I fix this, I fix that. So you go there and you devote all your resources to fixing those two things, and then you forget something else. And so now the next time you go out, then that goes to crap. Mm-hmm. Now you move to the next one and so on. And, and that's the problem. Um, you know, it, it's to me, it's like, listen, what does it take to be great at what you do? If, if you go to Chick-fil-A anywhere in the country and you walk in, you know how they're going to execute their drive through lines. Right. If they have a bad day, the manager may sit there and say, okay, guys, listen, this is what we need to do better. This is how we need to do this, all this other stuff. They don't say, Hey, call corporate and redesign the, the drive through line. <laughs> right. You know, they don't, they don't make that mistake. What they do is instead they, they say, look, we got to be better. Let's get back to the basics. Right. Let's do the things that we need to do to be successful. Right. Yeah. There's I, I heard you talk. I, yeah. Well, speaking of standards, you, you, you talked about this on a podcast, uh, not too long ago where you were talking about how you always seek out like McDonald's, I guess, to, to cause you like their yeah. diet Cokes or whatever. Yeah. And you were saying how you went into a McDonald's, it's like five o'clock in the evening and always. it, was, in it the was trash no, in, the morning. in the morning. And yeah. you, you said that that means somebody made that conscious decision when they closed up the night before that they're just going to leave the trash there. I, I want, I want your listeners to prove me wrong when McDonald's like, I'm going to be honest in COVID. Why is McDonald's have all the doors shuttered right now? Right. Right. Bizarro world to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Same with Burger King. I, I'm in the car a lot, right? So yeah. when you got to go to the bathroom, it's like, I, you know, I want to go somewhere and you know, whatever. And I go, I'm like, why are they shuttered? Right. Yeah. Like this, this is a conscious choice for a company to go. I mean, okay. Uh, safety. I know somebody's going to hit me up and say, oh, you know, safety and the whatever. Okay. Look, I get it. Okay. Uh, I understand it. But this is, you know, I don't know. Yeah. We stand in line all day long and then we go sit on a crowded airplane. So, yeah. um, you know, the, the thing is, you know, this makes sense, but you go to a McDonald's at five o'clock in the morning. Okay. Because if I'm going to give a talk later in the day, you know, or like at 10 o'clock, I'll find a McDonald's because they actually have like, when they choose to do it, they actually have pretty good eggs. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll put them on the griddle. And if you ask for them, they'll make hand cracked eggs. I mean, they're not bad. And and they're six bucks, you know, total breakfast. And so if I'm expensing it back to a customer, I don't want to do a forty five dollar hotel breakfast. That's right. Okay, so I'll go get a cup of coffee and a diet coke, and I'll sit there and I'll just allow myself to get my thoughts present for the day. Uh, I love my breakfast just to sit there sometimes and not be in a rush because usually it's before my clients are calling or my players are calling to check in, and and it's just quiet. But I'm always amazed when you walk in there. You you know, McDonald's has a little smell to it. Mm-hmm. You, you know the smell. Yeah, it's usually kind of hot. You look around; the tables are usually filthy. The yeah. floors are usually filthy. <laughs> the bathroom—you go in there; it's probably wet, and the, they're not super clean. They're not dirty; they're just not clean. Right. 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 Um, you, you, they give you your drink cup. You go to the drink trough. You look in the drink trough; it's usually dirty. There's some high C all over everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the the iced tea machines don't look very appetizing. It's not clean. It's not very inviting, right? Um, you know, probably one of the ice dispensers is not going to work, right? Um, you go, you, you know, you get ketchup and then maybe a ketchup, your ketchup thing is sticky or whatever. They give it to you and they're like, here you go. And it slides across the table or whatever. And you get the coffee. And what's amazing now that they do McCa- McCafe, it smells like soured milk all the time. Yes. When you stand at the yeah. counter, like it just, like somebody's got to make a choice to listen to this. And, well, and still, you know, the ice cream machine's never going to It's always work. broken. And you know yeah. why that is, right? right? Cause it's too hard to clean. Right. 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 Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing about it is, um, you know, I look at, I go in there and I, I sit there and think and say, there's a conscious choice that's being made here. Mm-hmm. And the conscious choice is just get by is good enough. Like yeah. it doesn't matter. We're the number one fast food agency in the world. And, and that it's not the individual. I mean, people say, well, it's the people who work there. No, it's not. It's the corporate dis- decision. It's the leadership. Mm-hmm. The leadership has made a decision that eh, it's okay. is good enough. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, they're hiring the same people who work at Chick-fil-A, um, the same pool of people. I mean, I remember being a kid, if you got a job at McDonald's, that was like the greatest place to learn manage at McDonald's right. University or Hamburger University, whatever they Hamburger called it. University, it yeah. Burger U. And th- it was like, you're going to get this great experience and exposure. That ain't the way now. Mm-mm. 
No. It's not the you way. Don't no. want that, yeah. No, you go to a Chick Fil A when you could go inside. Uh, they're not going to screw that up, man. They're right. they're going to have everything. And so I ask teams that. I'll say, which one are you, McDonald's or Chick-fil-A? Because if you ask a group, college-age kids, where would you rather go? Nobody raises their hand for McDonald's. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's culture, unanimous. right? It's I mean, culture. It's, a, it's, it's a culture thing. And I love where you talk about this. Uh, you give this example. Um, it might have even been on this same uh, show I was listening to where you said, at Alabama, when Devontae Smith wins the Heisman, the next day you yeah. show up in the building, there's the picture up already with all of the other so, Heisman Trophy winners. So that I was over there the next morning, and I, I walk up to go get a cup of coffee from the cafe from the, their, where they eat, and I look over, and where the two Heisman Trophies are from Mark Ingram and um, Derek Henry, like they're already ripping down the the – they're over – they're painting over or ripping down the – placards stuff yeah and i was like oh that'll be cool when i went back for lunch they already had the Devonte smith graphic <laughs> right. up there <laughs> yeah. yeah okay yeah. now now they probably had them kind of ready to go sure and yes they have the resources but it's an attitude that's sure. it is. it's an attitude of look we we everything we do is on point and skip used to make that point right he he used to tell the story about when he took the job at LSU, he made a list of about 120 things as he was driving in, his wife was driving their station wagon about what he wanted to accomplish. It was triple A lights. It was um, great concessions and stuff like that. And he used to talk about sending coaches in the stands to eat the popcorn early in his career. And it's true. It's a true story because this thing was why, if, if you're going to, if you're going to crap on one aspect of your performance and then it's going to show up. And I, I use an example like that. I call it the cheeseburger test. Mm-hmm. If I go to a restaurant and I'm not skinny, if I go to a restaurant <laughs> and they have, and I'm not talking like a olive garden. I've still, like yeah. Okay. Something. Well, I mean, you know, there are places that celebrate their cheeseburger on their menu. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the best ones in town is at a five-star restaurant here in Birmingham. Interesting. Um, and there's a, where did we go? Oh, we I was in New Orleans with my wife for a couple um for a PJ tour event and went to a couple places and they they were like our cheeseburger is the best in town. And like if you're going to put a cheeseburger on the menu as a restaurant and I order it that or like a club sandwich like come on how hard are they? Right. right. They're simple. Right? But if you order that and it's garbage. It's a frozen patty with a with it's not appetizing. Why would I ever believe you? for their more complicated dishes. Mm-hmm. If you can't put your effort on those things, why the hell are we doing this? Yeah. And there's a restaurant that came out of Baton Rouge that came out of my high school. Um, very proud alumnus of Catholic high school. A lot of uh, leadership has come out of that school. Um, but the guy who started walk-ons, which is a sports bar, which has now yeah. taken over the country. Um, Drew Brees is a major investor. The guy was a walk-on basketball player at LSU. And they think, we have one near our house. I'll probably go there for lunch today. You walk in and and I heard the bartender yesterday. She was talking to somebody and she was at somewhere else. She said, you know, at the old place, I could serve drinks. I could walk around and talk to my customers. She said, here, I have so much more to do. It takes us three hours to close down the bar every night. And I was like, damn straight. Right. That yeah. is leadership. Right. Right. right? But she's working here. She ain't working yeah. at that other place. No, right. she's over here because yeah. she's got the support. And you walk in, and the you know the beer is. Ser- if you're gonna have it on the menu, don't just throw some French fries on the plate. And this is what's important at all the performance, right? It's like if you're leading people as a leader, is your coffee maker. If you're gonna put a coffee maker in, contribute to it. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for the Keurig. I mean, I've had employees of mine mad that we didn't keep buying Keurig. I was like, look, I'm just trying to pay light bills, man. You know, Keurig is bring in some of your own, but he, but I got you a nice one Yeah, and bring your own stuff. Like it's available. If you're going to do it, look at the lobby, look at the, you know, the bathroom should be clean. It's if you're a baseball team, I don't, honestly, I don't care if your shoes are clean. Yeah. Well, and do never cared about that. Yeah. but what does the opposing team dugout look like? Right. Mm-hmm. Leave it there that you found it. And, and, keep, and keep it consistent throughout the whole process. A, a good friend of mine uh, tells a story about being at a restaurant one time and the waitress comes up and she's giving the specials. And every time she gets to the end of the special, she talks about elephant tuna. And he's like, 
doesn't say anything, you know, she goes out through the specials again, elephant tuna. And he finally, it just bugs him so much. And he says, oh, I'm so, ma'am, I got to ask elephant tuna. I've never heard of this before. And she goes, Oh, I'm sorry. Yellowfin tuna. She goes, you got to understand this is like my 12th table of the day. Yeah. And he's thinking, well, no, we're, you're our first waitress. Of, like, this is our, yeah. <laughs> this is our yeah. experience here. Don't Great let example. this being the 12th table of the day be the thing that uh, gets in the way. I'm going to butcher this story, but a friend of mine in business told me this story about blue M&Ms. And I thought it was brilliant. So Aerosmith, when they were first coming up in Boston, they, um, they had a manager who, who, you know, their stages were pretty dynamic and they required some... And they went into a place like in Pennsylvania or something like that. And it was kind of a historic theater. And after the concert was over, they get a bill that they had broken their stage. That their their, their pyrotechnics, their whatever, broke the stage. And the manager goes, it's impossible. No, it's not impossible. This is what happened. He goes, no, 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 it's impossible. He said, did you follow our um, our guidelines that we gave you on our rider? Oh, 100%, right along with it. He goes, then it's impossible. This has been engineeringly established. Nope, followed it. He goes, you know how I know you didn't follow it? He said, because in the writer we put in the very beginning, we wanted M&Ms in our, in our room. But in the middle of the stage dynamics, we put an additional writer that said, all M&Ms must be blue. Mm-hmm. When we went into the into the locker, we went into the, the waiting room, the green room, and we saw that they're multicolored. We knew y'all hadn't looked at it. It's it's there are blue M and M's all around us, right? And there are people mm-hmm. that we look at that that when people say, "Oh yeah, 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 I got that, I did that, I'm prepared," they're not. I mean, coaches that don't plan practice, and 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 I know coaches. I plan every practice. Really, why is it not written down and posted for every player? When y'all played at at college, right. Charles, was it posted? Yeah, did, was y'all's practice yeah. posted? Yeah, not always. Yeah, not always, yeah. but yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but yeah. but we we did for the most part. Yeah, yeah, we were always. Yeah, and I can tell you that he could look back to April twenty seventh, eight years ago, and it would match. Yeah, mm-hmm. because he would review it, and we'd go to the College World Series, and everyone else is out there, and they're celebrating, and they're wearing their shorts, and they got their video cameras out, and we would have the same first. Pra- oh, I hated the first practice of Omaha. Yeah. I hated it because it was long. It was, we went back into the basics of bunt right. coverages and pit golfs and pop flies, which was the very first practice of our fall and spring every year. And the pitchers ran again. Shit, we hadn't run in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was like, here we go. But there was a reason for that. Right. Right. You don't rest your laurels until you're done. Right. Um, you know, uh, you do the things you're trained to do and you do them extremely well. And, yeah. and too many people are winging it based yeah. on talent, mm-hmm. based on good fortune. And they think they're really good because, you know, I mean, I, 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 you know, I had a little success. Coach used to say we had a transfer pitcher that came in one year and he was, he would talk about, well, you know, I, I pitched a one run game and got beat against Texas or Texas A&M and coach goes, in the middle of it, goes, you know, the sign of a bad pitcher is one that loses a bunch of one run games. Mm. He said, because you're not doing what it takes to get your team to win. Very teams good. that are close are actually further away than teams that are getting blown out. He said, I know you guys don't understand that because, but he said, when there's no pressure, you're close, but right. the best teams win the one run games. The best teams win the five point game. The best teams do that because they're prepared to be in that situation. I love that. And it, it, and, and it's one of those things uh, and, you know, not just to put a bow on that whole uh, standards, you know, and, and doing paying attention to the details is, you mentioned Brian Kite earlier. We had him on as a guest on the show. We're, we talk about Urban Meyer's book, and he, there's a great line in there: "What you accept, you promote." Yeah. You know, as far as culture goes. I mean, if if you're going to accept all of this, hey Brett, I want to in the last ten minutes here, um, I want you to get into something because I know this is a pain point for a lot of listeners. It's a pain point for a lot of coaches out there who are dealing with players. Um, when you talk about confidence, we're going to shift gears here for a second. I want, I want you to talk a little bit about confidence. And um, it, you mentioned in the book, a person who lacks the self-confidence to be great and the self-confidence to overcome challenges invariably looks for fixes and solutions from others rather than searching for the answers within how do you answer people when they ask you? Uh, and I'm sure because I think this is one of those things where people misinterpret and think, oh, well, 
Brett's dealing with all these professional golfers and professional players, as well as these elite college athletes, their confidence is through the roof. They'd probably be very wrong in thinking that, correct? I mean, it's that the, those guys are constantly going through challenges in their head, about, you know, as it relates to confidence. So how do you handle it when people uh, ask you how they can become more confident or overcome that self-doubt? So the, the greatest level to me is self-belief. It's a step above confidence. Self-belief is I can handle it. I am the difference maker anytime, anywhere, anyhow. Okay. Mm. What builds belief is confidence. I know I can do it when I'm presented with the challenge. Okay. What builds confidence is trust. If I do this, this happens. If I do this, that happens. If this, it's that kind of thing, right? What builds trust is a plan. And what builds a plan is a vision. So the question is, what do you want? Mm. So if you just want to get out of the pain, then you're going to find band-aids. But if you want to be the best, all right, if you want to be epic, if you want to be a Hall of Famer, if you want to, if you just want to play on your high school team, then let's build a plan to do it. Okay. That's your vision. Be willing to admit it. Don't be afraid to put it out there. That's the manifesto, right? You've mm-hmm. got to be willing to lay it on the line. If you're not willing to lay it on the line, then all you're gonna that that's okay. Just l- tell me what you want. Mm-hmm. Like, not everybody's willing to make the uh, the, the, not everybody is willing to make the, the sacrifices that of what it takes. Right. So you look at everything that happens and, um, what it takes to be the best is you got to have the sacrifices. Like everybody will start out. Yeah. Oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And then it just starts eroding. Mm-hmm. And so what I want them to do is to know is like, look, if we're going to build trust, we got to do it in consistencies over and over and over again. Yeah, And then that will start building some trust. If I do X, Y happens. Then all of a sudden it's like, well, the confidence is I know I can create Y. And then belief is I am the reason that Y happens. Mm-hmm. And that's the process that you have to do. Yeah, And and so when somebody's like, oh, I'm just looking for confidence. I'm like, okay, <clears throat> sure. You're looking for a fix. Right. But if you could, if you come in and say, are you willing to go through the darkness in order to come out on the other side? then great, let's do it. Now, <clears throat> I think it's it's really important um, that that we're willing to put it out on the line and do that. But I just, I, I find that most people say they want to do it and very few people actually want to do it. Yeah. Very few people are willing to, to say, I want to be great at what I do. Very few people are willing to, to actually do what it takes to do that, right? Um, like I'll see kids that come into Bama, for instance, or we're at LSU, right? They were superstars and they come in and it got hard and then they bailed. Mm-hmm. Mm. They may have bailed emotionally because when it got really hard and they were getting exposed and they were being shown up and because somebody was hungrier than them. Mm-hmm. Okay. And somebody was in there, you know, watching extra film and finding a way like you, that's what you got to do. I mean, you know, it's, 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 I try to tell kids who are leaving, going into the workforce now that are done playing sports. It's like, look, if you want to be successful in the workforce, you don't tell me you're a hard worker and don't tell me you want it. Everybody's going to tell me they're a hard worker, but they don't right. know what it is. And everybody's right. going to tell me they want it until something shinier comes along. If you want to succeed at the highest level, are you willing to do what no one else is willing to do? Are you willing to put in the work, be prepared to, to learn more about your job than is necessary to develop an expertise um, you know, if you're a coach, you know, it's not your hitting coach's job to understand the swing. It's not your offensive lines coach. You know, I, I can guarantee you, I can put the best coaches in the country and put them in a different position and they're going to learn it. Yeah. They're going to immerse themselves in everything that it takes to be great at what they do. And that's what I want them to understand is like, you got to understand what it takes for you to succeed, you know, and, and do the little things that other people aren't willing to do to get ahead. I love it. I um, want to encourage everybody. The book is The Mind Side Manifesto, The Urgency to Create a Competitive Mindset. And then uh, Brett was talking about the new book coming out. Um, and then also the game plan, Managing Your Champ and Chump. What's the, the new book title? Suckville? Yeah, yeah it's, it's Break Free from Suckville. Break Free um, from Suckville. I love it. Yep. And Brett, tell us uh, also that you have the Catalyst School, which is a coach's training. Yep. There's the Attacker Golf Training System. And what's great, guys, is those of you who are listening 
that are still inside, you know, uh, COVID, whatever the case would be. All of a lot of this stuff's virtual training. You can find oh, it yeah. at brettmccabe.com and it's B H R E T T M C C A B E. And then also on Twitter, on Instagram at Dr. Brett McCabe. I highly, highly encourage the listeners to follow him for content. Um, I I'm, I'm, happy that I made it through an hour without totally fanboying a little bit because I'm a big <laughs> Brett McCabe fan. I was telling Brandon going into this show, I was like, all right, I'm going to try to uh, make sure I don't sound like I'm just totally geeked out on everything that he's putting out there. But I, but I do think that I, I like your approach to it because you, and this is what I think I really appreciated the most about the book was you had a way of weaving in those stories, but made it very understandable for somebody who's not that clinical psychologist. They're not coming from that psych background that can understand, Hey, these are some systems and strategies I can take that are going to help me become a better version of myself. And that's really what our mental advantage podcast is all about is just trying to give people those systems to put it together. Yeah. I I don't know. You know, I I know when I started doing this, um, I started working when I left pharma 11 years ago. Um, I remember, you know, like I'd study other guys and I'd watch what they did. And I was like, okay, I got to do that. And then I, I got to a point of like, you know what? I just got to be me. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I see my clients, I'm in shorts. If they're, yeah. seeing them, I don't care. Like, right. you know, I, when I go out and work with my players, we may do it over dinner. We may do it. I've done it at the craps table, you know, mm-hmm. take them there. And, and, <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, I, I just realized that I'm not very psyche. Um, mm-hmm. I understand why things happen from a psychologist standpoint, but what I care about and what I care greatly about is that my players reach the level of success that they're capable of, that they understand their own psychological fingerprint and they understand who they are and they understand how to help themselves get better. If I can just be one small piece of that, I want to be in the shadows, but if I can just be one small piece of that, then that's the greatest joy and responsibility a professor, a professional can ever have to, to see a player reach their level of success and their abilities and and to to realize what they're capable of that they did that like I didn't do anything for them, their other coaches didn't do anything. I mean we we served them and we provided them evidence, and we provided them with tools. But they used the tools when it mattered, and I want them to celebrate their successes because they're the ones that are doing things that we can't do. And yeah. that's just an absolute honor to be a part of people's teams and organizations because of that. That's why you're one That's of the awesome. best at it. We'll give Absolutely. you the last word on that. Hey, when you're out there on the tour, say hi to our friend, uh, Mo Pickens. He, oh, Mo yeah, Dr. Is, Mo. Uh, Dr. Oh, yeah, Mo's absolutely. been on our show. We were doing some stuff with him and just a really great guy. Yep. So uh, We see each other all the time. One of our Two of our players, his player and my player, do quite a bit of practice rounds together. So oh, is that right? awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell him we said hello. Uh, do. And uh, we can't thank you enough, Brett, for yeah. joining us. And hopefully we'll be able to drag you back on the show another absolutely. time late in the future. Anytime. Hopefully to talk about your book. When your book comes out, why don't we make a date to yeah. make that happen? We will do that. That'll be great. Awesome. awesome. Want to provide feedback or stay up to date with the show? Visit our Instagram page at Mental Advantage Podcast. Or you can send us an email at podcast at mentaladvantage.net. To have John Cullen work with you or your team, please write to him at john.cullen at mentaladvantage.net. Thanks for listening to today's episode.